All right, welcome to Park Media. I'm your host today, Vince Emanuele, and we are joined by Liza Featherstone. Liza is a journalist based in New York City and a contributing editor to The Nation. She's also a writer at Jacobin. She also writes an, adv- an advice column, I'm sorry, for The Nation called Asking for a Friend. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, Miss, Rolling Stone, and many other outlets. She is the co-author of Students Against Sweatshops, The Making of a Movement, and author of Selling Women Short, The Landmake, Landmark Battle for Workers' Rights at Walmart. She is the editor of False Choices, The Faux Feminism of Hillary Clinton, and her most recent book, Divining Desire, is what we'll be talking about today. Liza, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Vince. All right, let's start real simple. What made you write this book, and can you explain to us what a focus group is? Oh, sure. Um, so the the book came about in a um, in a somewhat unusual way. Um, I uh, um, so my editor Colin Robinson. Um, was um, then at Simon and Schuster, um, and um, he later left and founded Or Books, um, and uh, um, and we. Um, it was during the Obama years. It was actually right at the beginning of the Obama administration, and I was writing. Um, I was writing a number of pieces on the. Um, ambiguities in public opinion research around the big financial bailout of 2007, 2008, 2007. Um, And and it was very, it was very confusing. It was like people really were mad about the bailout, but also, um, you know, also kind of understood that it was necessary to save the economy, but were angry at the banks. And it also really depended on how you how pollsters ask the question, um, and um, and you know so um, so I was I remember I was I was telling Colin about this, and then we were also you know talking a lot about how uh, what did it mean that Obama had just been elected after um, such a long time of Republican reign, you know, and um, and did some of these ambiguities around, um, you know, big government action, like big government actions like the bailout and, um, and the idea of stimulus um, to restart the economy. Did, um, did those things suggest that people were um, starting to, um, you know, look more in a kinder way at um, the idea of big government, you know, and, you know, sort of, you know, having, ha- having the government be um, a positive force that could do things for people, just, you know, basic kind of liberal, like liberal from way back um, ideas. <laughs> um, and, um, and, um, and, you know, and, and so, um, you know, so we, so we kind of conceived this idea that, um, that um, we should, that um, we should do a book on um, this this moment and um, you know the public's um, complicated feelings about government and, you know and um, so like any like out of touch cultural elites <laughs> who don't really know much about what the masses are thinking we were then like we should be in some focus groups <laughs> <laughs> and um and then uh and so to figure out how to do this um i interviewed um a friend of mine who is a um, a market researcher you know so and, you felt and, like lazarus felt in uh and the Vien- in, in Vienna, I would, <laughs> You're like, I would, what are the people would, up to? <laughs> exactly, we're, we were exactly like the red Viennese, <laughs> like the elitist red Viennese. Um, I mean, and so so I uh, so I inter- so I I sat down and talked with uh, my with a friend of mine who is a market researcher, um, and that conversation. Um, became the first in many um, interviews that I ended up doing with market researchers, um, and um, and I I went back to Colin, uh, my editor, and I said, Colin, focus groups are really strange. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and you attended him, many, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I told him a little bit about why, and he said, um, you know, because he's English and speaks this way. Well, I think that's your book. So that we were then, I was then onto a completely different project. Right on. 
And I, I mean, one of the first things that surprised me and of course probably bummed me out a little bit, though the intention it seemed was pretty clear was that this actually, that the focus group comes from the left, um, yeah. both abroad and then in the United States is this sort of like orientation around World War II, this mobilization of, of democratic resources and, and trying to like, you know, mobilize the state and the, and the nation state project in, in the pursuit of war. But t- tell us a little bit about the origins of this. This comes from the left. It comes out of Vienna and then makes its way to the United States during World War II or, or in that period. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and that was something that really surprised me um, in um, in researching this um, as well. Um, the uh, um, the focus group has its origins um, in um, in in Red Vienna, where um, um, where um, you know um, idealistic but out of touch social democrats <laughs> like Colin and myself um, were um, actually you know in a position to um, um, you know th- run the government um, and you know and th- and they, um, th- they began trying to create um, municipal socialism um, s- sort of um, socialism in one city you know it w- which w- you know with with quite a hostile um, r- you know with not even democracy in the rest of the country country um and um and um and since um um socialism was um w- was was new to the working class of vienna um and um democracy was also new um, you know relatively um so um so, so they they realized that um in order to um in order to um, create consensus to get consensus um, for the things that they wanted to, um, to do. Um, you know, um, you know, which which were basic good socialist um, th- things. You know, big, um, you know, um, public spending on programs to um, to help everyone, decent schools, you know, decent you know healthcare, um, um, all, all that stuff. Um, they would really have to. Um, them, they would really have to try to um, create um, people that could go along with this, you know. I mean, people who and 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 you know and people who were um, um, were um, and and they had, um, you know, it, I think like it's 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 absolutely true that um, any any political project requires. Um, making big changes in consciousness and culture in ways that we don't always consider on the left. Um, the Red Viennese probably went a little bit overboard in um, the extent to which they imposed their elitist cultural <laughs> principles on the working class. Like they were, um, they would, you know, they really wanted the working class to, um, you know, stop drinking, play team sports, abstain from premarital sex, like all of these, you know, um, you know, prescriptions, which as you might imagine, the working class, like most people, wasn't very interested in, in going along with, <laughs> you know, so, um, and, uh, um, and they, they wanted them to listen to opera instead of to, um, you know, soap operas. Um, and, you know, so, so they, they would do a lot of, um, of what it what we now think of as market research um, to, um, to to try to um, um, figure this out and um, and 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 learn when their message was not working and when they were just um, really not um, connecting um, with um, with the public. Um, a young man um, who um, was a sort of a rising. Um, young socialist in the ranks at this time um, was um, Paul Lazarsfeld, um, and um, um, he was a um, he he was from a um, a um, sort of a fa- a fa- intelligentsia family. Um, his um, his mom was a psychoanalyst who had. Um, you know, a, a nice garden. So she had many, you know, um, like garden parties where the social democratic um, like elite would 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 gather. And you know, he was really raised um, by um, by by these um, um, intellectuals and activists um, um, in in that world. And um, um, and um, he 
um, so and and he so he he was um, also a um, um, a, a sort of a, a social scientist. Um, I always forget when we had these when these categories emerge of like sociology or um, you know what specific social science uh, scientists we, science we would have heard of it, we would have called it then. But um, but I, th I think something like social psychology um, is, is probably what it would have been called then and it would be called sociology now. Um, and, um, and so, um, so, so he, he, he began, um, he began trying out some of these, these methodologies then. Now um, he, um, he eventually the um, right wing, um, the right wing government in Austria um, um, and um, you know, took over um, and the Red Viennese were defeated and um, and also um, the Nazis um, were ascendant and so and Lazarsfeld being Jewish had to get out um, of Austria and he, he fled and he came to the United States um, and um, and in the, once in the United States um, he he did the same kind of work um, what we would now call qualitative research, um, and um, and perfecting the art of um, asking people why um, they um, did or did not like things, why they um, did the things that they did, why they preferred the things that they preferred, and and perf and you know f um, figuring out better and better better methodologies to do that. He starts working. Um, he starts an institute at Princeton called the Princeton Office for Radio Research um, at his um, um, market research in the radio industry um, is really needed um, at that time. You know, this is, um, you know, the, um, this is like 1920s, 30s. Um, and, um, but um, then, um, you know, and, and eventually he, he sets up an institute at Columbia University that's similar, um, and um, and and this um, you know he 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 really goes back to, in a way to his Red Viennese um, social democratic roots, um, and um, and really um, in fully invents the um, the focus group um, in the context of um, of um, a, con a government contract. Um, from the Roosevelt administration to um, test um, propaganda um, around World War II, um, and you know what, what to test what kinds of radio arguments, um, what kinds of radio narratives and stories um, would would um, convince um, Americans to support the um, make the sacrifices and support. Um, entering World War II, um, he so he he finds um, it, it's it's pretty interesting um, and you know I'm not the um, I mean it's, a, it's the book builds on research done by other historians um, James Spiller is one um, and um, and the uh, um, the the, the the you know the recent, they 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 found that um you know by um, talking to people in these small discussion groups and really focusing keyword <laughs> um, the uh, their attention on one on one thing one text um you could you could you could learn a, a lot more about their feelings and attitudes than just simply you know talking to them about a topic you know like nazis in general you know, um, you know, and um, and so you could play them this radio broadcast, um, and um, and discover um, uh, surprising things. Um, and you could, and one one of the things that um that they that they found, for example, was that um their propaganda was too dehumanizing and too scary in its depiction of the Nazis. <laughs> 
Yeah, when I like you, that like, one. <laughs> yeah. So when you, it when made you, Americans too scared. They were like, no, fuck this. These people are going to kill us all. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Because they made them sound so bloodthirsty. And so I think their particular lack of mercy, um, you know, and, um, and, and Americans were like, oh, no, thanks. Um, let's, 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 it's better to just put our heads down and uh, hide from these guys. Um, and, uh, um, I, I have actually a, a, a this is a, a, a poster, but and not an actual um, sound example. But um, but but I, I in the book I have a picture as an illustration for this um, section that shows um, a, uh, um, a a Nazi depicted as like a two headed monster. You know, so like just the kind of um, a, a thing that that would not make you necessarily want to engage. Um, and uh, <laughs> um, and so, um, so 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 the, the so so they found um, you know and and folk and the the sort of the group discussion um, um, and depth interview. Um, was a good way to discover that because if if you simply had had played this and had people fill out a survey, you would have been like, they don't like it, they don't want to support the effort. Why? You know, we don't know. We don't know what wasn't working. But when you when you talk to people in that way, um, you you could you could find out. And what they found was that you that it it was much better to emphasize um, that. Um, that we need to defend our way of life um, and, you know, like a, a sort of a positive message um, about, um, about democracy and, um, and its, you know, its, its advantages and its, its possibilities. So, um, so, so that was, so, so that, that was the beginning. And then Lazarsfeld and his institute also did a lot of, um, less inspiring and less important um, research. They did a lot of corporate contracts, you know, like how to, um, you know, how to, how do you feel about your refrigerator or stuff like that. Right. Right. That was, I was just about to jump into the sort of Madison Ave turn. I mean, because it seems to me that that's an important, that along the way there are not necessarily from chapter to chapter, but there's these different moments in different decades when the intention the ways in which these groups are used changes fundamentally. I mean, it seems that, I mean, there's the, the line running throughout the book, of course, is that these are needed because we're in an inherently unequal capitalist system and all the rest. I mean, this, this runs throughout, but there is a change after this period going into this Madison Ave period where Lazarsfeld, the social Democrats in the United States in red Vienna, there was this, there was an understanding that we were in this inherently unequal uh, society system and that there was a gap between elites and ordinary people and that we were trying to bridge that gap for like a more, I don't know, you don't use the term, but I guess I'm thinking like a more harmonious sort of relationship within this social democratic system, understanding it's just sort of understood that these power inequalities are going to remain this way forever. So we're not going to actually like fundamentally challenge power distribution. We're just going to try and like ease this over best we can. But then that changes after this period, as you mentioned, where Lazarsfeld and and corporate America are like, oh no. But this also has to do with like big world geopolitical realities. Like the war is over. So like at first there's the need to like mobilize everyone to fight the Nazis when a lot of people really don't want to go to war halfway around the world, especially after World War I. And yeah. then you get into this new period where it's like, oh shit, all the GIs are home. What the fuck are we going to do? Like, what are we, how are we going to keep this economy going? Because the economy was largely being pumped up by the war economy. Now the war economy is over and it's like, holy shit, we need to get these people to buy shit. And then boom, I'll let you take it from there. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um the um the, the and for, first of all yeah, yes um you absolutely have the argument of the book correct i mean that that it really is um the the focus group was always um a a compromise i mean it was always a um um and it it comes out of an acknowledgement that there is a gap between the elite decision makers um, and and the masses, and that to make um, either 
um, that to, to make um, democracy work in an unequal society, um, the elite decision makers have to have ways of figuring out um, what the people think. Um, the project, um, bec the, the project, however, um, changes as the needs of the elites change. Um, and, um, and as, um, and as I argue in the book, as the elites also, um, kind of degenerate and the project of the elites degenerates, you know, right. so, um, so, you know, and again, like, I'm not saying this just is the book is not an argument for, um, that we need better elites, but, certainly our elites have declined um you know, so um so the um, so yes so so the so the so the project in mid-century um as you um absolutely rightly um observe um becomes um, moves from um fighting the nazis and defending democracy um i don't even think that's too simple a way to say it um and um, to selling shit, <laughs> selling people shit, and selling people shit that they don't um, really um, yet know that they need and really don't necessarily need at all. Um, so this is keeping. This is um, remember. Um, you know, people have been. Um, told for years um, that they need to um, sacrifice, get by on less. People have been willing to do that for a greater collective good. Like that propaganda has actually been pretty successful. Um, and, um, and, you know, because uh, yeah, the, and the, the war and the war effort is really kind of a persuasive and not a forced. It's a triumph of persuasion rather than force, um, and and that's um, that's really interesting too. Um, and um, and um, but the um, um, but but they now um, you know bu um, bu business lacks um, the um, the government um, as a huge customer for everything. The government doesn't need. People doesn't need them to make all this stuff anymore now that the war is over. Um, the um, and um, and um, and actually, um, Lazarsfeld is in his own um, little um, corner of that because um, the um, his institute doesn't have any more government contracts as the right. war dries up. So right. he's really in the same position as corporate America of needing, he needs clients. Um, and, um, and, uh, and corporate America needs to find ways to, um, um, to persuade um, a pretty um, austere and sacrificing public um, to, um, um, and get more decadent and spend money, um, and you know, and so so they um, um, so it's a real um, um, explosion of advertising um, and um, and of, of various um, experiments in um, in in persuasion, um, and so the focus group in, at, at this point. Um, really um, becomes um, um, much more widely um, used. Um, so not just um, not just in these in these sort of governmental political ways, but um, but in um, yeah, um, but but by um, but by Madison Avenue, which really um, needs to um, find out what will make people buy. And the way to like and the way to like the way that the the framing of what. The United States project was at that time was like this. I, I know one of the phrases was um, consumer power. So there's like mm -hmm. this, like yeah. as an alternative to communism. And, I, and this is funny because my dad in like very deep Chicago, Italian, broken English would be like, use kids today are exactly what the fucking government said the communists were going to look like. He's like, you all look the same. He goes, you talk the same. You listen to the same bullshit. He's like, this is what they said the communists were going to look like. He's like, that's what all used kids look like today. <laughs> oh my as, I'm, goodness. as I'm reading yeah. this, I'm just like, yes, towards the end, of course, you make the point that's become, I think, clear to everyone that like, 
even with more consumer choices, like the paradox is with more choices, with more consumerism and competition, like there is more sameness. I mean, we can get to that, but yeah. this no, like, absolutely. as an alternative to communist to the communist project, it was like, oh no, you, like consumer power. And then the other thing that keeps um, surprising me as I go back and read the history, f- different histories from that period was this central role of psychoanalysis. Like, how people at that time were just like so wrapped up in like where these ideas were coming from, where the desires come from, what makes people tick, how much of this is tied to like people's ideas around sex and like all these deep, whatever yearnings from your childhood. And I just, it, it's, it, it, it always surprises me, but if you want to talk a little bit about that connection, because there is a divide, um, I know I wrote it down here somewhere, but there is a divide between the way that this was applied in the United States, sort of drifting away from Freud and using, um, is it Ditcher or Alder, Alderan? Oh yeah. So, um, so, um, so yeah, anyway, sorry, I don't want to just keep rambling. Yeah. I, I love it. it. It's it's actually helpful because um because I wrote the book a while ago, so I, I, I and and I actually even spent a little time um rereading um rereading it in yeah. preparation to come on your show. Every because, author that we've had on says the same thing, so it's like I was a little detached uh, from it. So it's it's really nice uh, for me that you read it so carefully and are doing such a good job of. of signing signposting and summarizing um the um so yeah absolutely the um um in so in in the 50s um psychoanalysis is a huge part of the popular culture um and um and and there's there's all kinds of um it, like just like Freud jokes and like references to psychoanalysis come up in popular movies of that time. And, and you know, even um, like the, even concepts like um, Freudian slip or um, sometimes a cigar is not a cigar. Like <laughs> those things actually don't, those ideas actually and phrases don't come from Freud. They come from American pop culture's experience in the fifties of Freudianism because it was so, it was so widespread. People were so um, intrigued by the idea of the unconscious. Um, so that's the context. Um, and um and and in so in that context, um, advertisers and marketers um, are incredibly interested in how can we um, deploy um, um, what the Europeans are learning about the subconscious um, to get people to um, buy things. The big project, of the big project of the mid-century now, um, and um, and the um, and and so the the um, so so the focus groups. Um, make um, a lot of um, of use of psychoanalytic methods. Um, you know, getting people to getting people to just talk and reveal um, desires and 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 deep feelings, um, as you say, particularly about sex and family, um, a home, um, those kinds of yearnings. Um, they um, the you know there there are just like insights like. Um, you know, does the man, does the man want a car that is more like a wife or more like a right. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, or the egg <laughs> or the eggs, Oh or the yeah. eggs. And then how they like, how somebody, I forget which person it was, but you could tell the story. <laughs> yes. Yes. Sure. And this, you know, so it's funny because this, this anecdote is in my book and then um, I, um, and then I hope people will look at footnotes because there's a footnote um, noting that um, that the anecdote is um, is very widely told and um, has been questioned. You know, so like yeah. so so it's sort of this story that is important to the lore about market research in that period, um, but um, but may or may not be true um or may or may not be exactly true so but the the lore um around this is um um that um that the um so people were very um, ambivalent about prepared foods but also very interested 
women were very interested in prepared foods, like the idea the, and ways to make um, cooking and preparing food for the family more efficient. Um, and um, and yet they they would it, yet it was hard. To, to persuade them to um, to buy some of this stuff, um, and um, and you know market research focus groups um, and discussion, you know deep discussion could reveal some of the um, ambivalence that people had um, about this and why, um, and a, a lot of the reason was that um, housewives felt guilty taking these kinds of shortcuts. Like, you know, if I really love my family, I should make a cake from scratch. And, um, and um, you know, and, you know, and, you know, like, I mean, it's funny because like, you know, I, I, I'm, after doing all this work, I mean, I say that and I'm like, I kind of think I feel that way, you know? I mean, it's like these things are not very easy to shake, these ideas. Yeah. Um, and so, um, so, um, so I had the so, same feeling as, I had so the same so, feeling as a consumer throughout reading this book. Yeah, I was like, exactly. oh, Jesus, like, you're also hostage to half of this shit, so don't fool yourself. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, um, so, um, so Ernest Dichter, who was, um, actually a former student um, of Paul Lazarsfeld and also a Viennese, um, Im Viennese immigrant to the United States, um, was um, a real star of um, psychoanalytic um, market research and kind of a celebrity um, in, in this area. Um, and um, and uh, and the lore uh, the lore goes um, that he uh, that he, he discovered in his focus groups that um, that um, you know that you know women felt um, women felt bad um, about the stuff they felt they were um, not really providing for their families when they made a cake from scratch so he recommended that the um, cake companies um, direct them to add an egg um, and that this and that therefore the cake sales took off um, this is, it's a little questionable because um, there is like there, there is there is research showing that the direction to add an egg, um, you know, some some cake mixes were recommending that decades earlier. You know, it's not a it's it's not a, as as it's not as clean and an anecdote um, as um, um, as 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 the rumors will will have it, um, but it's um, but some version of it is true and it's um, and it's a it's and it is it is a beautiful example of how um, market research how focus groups um, could um, reveal these these kinds of desires that um, that were um, um, hidden obscure to people in themselves and, you know so obscure to the people themselves and and could be revealed through talk um, the, um, the so Interestingly, psychoanalysis itself really changes in coming over, in coming from Europe to the United States. Um, and um, and Russell, Russell Jacoby has written about this and I draw on that um, in the book. Um, and it's really um, amazing for market research because the way that psychoanalysis changes when coming to the United States makes it much more applicable to this kind of um, use. So, um, so whereas um, the, um, the European psychoanalysts are kind of fundamentally pessimistic about human happiness. Uh, I mean, they basically you know, feel like, you know, all of life is kind of, um, you know, to a certain degree, um, misery and struggle and- um, I you agreed know, with those parts. I agreed you know, with those parts. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I'm with this much more. Like, this makes a lot of sense. <laughs> totally. Like, you know, all of life is kind of misery and struggle and like, you, you can just, you know, the better stand it and become more, more self-aware. Um, and, um, and, and that's, that's really Freud. I mean, like, like, yeah. and his contemporaries and, you know, and that's, that's really the European view. Um, and, um, and, and in, in America, um, it, it, be, it, it becomes so, but there was a Vien, there was a Viennese um, psychoanalyst um, 
um, um, named Adler, who um, who had a, a much more um, um, a, 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 a much more um, optimistic view of um, human adaptation, you know, and that for him, the view, the goal of psychoanalysis was um, that the the individual needs um, to um, figure out how to um, adapt socially and be part of um, of of groups and be be part of a collective, um, and you can see how. This comes out of red, the red Viennese thinking, like that. Um, that that the the red Viennese needed to to nourish um, humans that could be part of a collective project. Um, now, um, in the American context, um, now it, America, mid-century America, um, also needs people who can adapt to society, just a very different kind of society than the Red Viennese had, had, had envisioned. But they right. do also need people who will strive, um, you know, who will, um, who, who can, you know, be, um, um, be ambitious, be part of a corporate team, be part of a, a corporate project, um, who will, um, um, you know, who will not be, um, you know, just like um, sitting on a street corner smoking cigarettes and being alienated as would have been perfectly okay in Freud's world. That's what I was doing doing before this interview. (laughs) Right. I mean, exactly. Like that's what seems perfectly normal to a lot of us. Um, But not the ideal in the era of the gray gray flannel suit. Um, So you you need to work through your issues and put on the gray flannel suit. You know, I mean, and so, um, so... Um, as you might imagine, this form of psychoanalysis is a lot more um, adapt is is a lot more useful to um, to marketers and so forth because um, because they what they really want is to um, um, to tap into those kinds of strivings like what motivates people like what do people um, what do people dream of that they what are their dreams? What do they want? Um, um, you know, what, um, you know, do they, do they want to be more handsome, more successful? Um, you know, these, these kinds of, um, of sort of like less alienating, less alienated and more, um, um, you know, more conformist, more, um, you know, more, um, sort of sociable and maybe competitive um uh, urges um so um so that's where um you know psychoanalysis ends up being um very um v- very useful um to Madison Avenue in the 50s and really um helps them to figure out um messages that will um, that, that will sell things to people and even gets it into and, and you even see a lot of psychologists going to work for Madison Avenue, and there's even um, um, group therapy um, starts in the '50s because um, because for the same reason, people in the '50s really um, there's a big emphasis um, in you know to adapt to mid-century post-war capitalism. There's this big emphasis on figuring out how to get along in groups. Um, so group therapy is seen as this really like important uh, thing, you know, way to put yourself in a laboratory and figure out how to get along. And then then those techniques that the psychologists perfect in the group therapy setting, they also begin realizing, you know, I, I can make much more money bringing like doing this um for um for advertising um so they bring it they bring those methods um into the focus group as well it sounds like it sounds like i mean it reminds me of so much and i don't want to keep going off into these digressions because i know that we're only past chapter two but i <laughs> i uh and i don't want to take too much of your time so another thing i was going to say to you liza just looking at the clock if you want to we That's could, sort of my long-windedness. I'm, I'm no, it's sure. all good. It's it's all good on our end. I mean, you're, it's absolutely no problem on our end. You have a family on your end. We're just 
uh, smoking cigarettes on the street corner with existential <laughs> crises. So Sergio and I will be fine. My concern is like, do you think we should do a, a first half? Like do like an hour, hour, oh, 10, yeah. like let's do like an hour, hour, 10 minutes and do like a first half of the book. And then maybe we can do something in a few weeks when you have time again. That'd be perfect. Okay, cool. Me. Yeah. Cause I, I would rather, yeah. I mean, I wanted to ask just to be courteous. Um, yeah, that's, that's perfect. Yeah. So yeah, the, damn it. I'm going to forget what you ended with. Cause you taught, you were mentioning the, uh, the role of group therapy at this time. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was following along. I had a bunch of things I was thinking. Oh, what the the thing you mentioned about people getting jobs, it's like it reminds me of like all the artist friends I have today or a lot of academics that I know who mm -hmm. like everybody. And this is a theme that pops up throughout the book as well through different contexts, through like a class lens, through a lens of like expertise, but then also through like a gendered lens as well, where it's like a lot of these folks have these skills and this knowledge and it's like, well, what is the entity that can pay you to actually do this work many right. times with really good intentions. But that also seems like a theme that comes up throughout the book. I don't know if you want to mention something about that now or. Um, so that's actually incredibly important. And, um, and I found, um, I found really interesting um, um, memos in the um, the J, J. Walter Thompson was a major advertiser um, um, at the at the time, and and I found um, these these great memos in which they um, they talk about how um, we um, uh, we need to bring in um, more um, academics, like like we like we have to study um, the um, um, the you know the 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 people and figure out um you know what they want and what will um what will help sell things to them and to do that um we have we need to tap into all the expertise that is in the universities and you know and so they were really um you know you know try like you know the paul lazarsfeld and his institute are just one example like they were really bringing in um, a lot of um scholars that um that they thought could um could provide insight um here and um and um and so um and the so yeah psychologists sociologists um you know all, all like all all kinds of um of experts were um were you know, being able to um, um, to do the work that they did because they were paid um, by um, and in Lazarsfeld's case, I mean, is it's it was an, it was interesting because um, the um, the his institute would always get these corporate con um, contracts and um, and um, that money enabled them to do all kinds of um, other. Um, sort of um, social science work that most of us would consider more important, you know, it's like studying race relations and, you know, um, stuff right. like that, that we really, um, most people would agree social scientists should do, you know, um, and, um, and, and he was um, very entrepreneurial about making that happen. I mean, he's, he's like, um, you know, like we, like we all have um, friends like this who are like really good at like doing some kind of corporate job and then they're like, you know, working on their record album on the weekend, you know, or right. something like, so he's like, he's just kind of an early adapter to that model of like <laughs> thinking at how to sell out so you can do the real work. Right, you know? right. um, um, and, um, and, um, but, um, but a lot of these people are just selling out, you know, because the fifties, fifties finally offers an opportunity, you know, I mean, and, you know, and so, so and also, um, also the fifties is, you know, um, like is, you know, it's suburbanization and, um, you know, and uh, like new, um, new and sort of more, um, um, you know, bigger and more demanding standards of domesticity that cost money, and you know, right. so people are, are so people are just starting to um, um, look for more ways to sell out, and um, and Madison Avenue is really happy to um, provide those. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I. It, um, well, it actually, kind of reminds me of reminds me of more recently when um, when 
um, the just financialization and uh, you know hedge funds and private equity and all that stuff and you get people who have like engineering degrees that would be, be very useful to society like we certainly need engineers to do stuff and you know but and they start figuring out oh but i can make so much more money like working for a hedge fund doing something totally useless yeah or on the yeah or on the west coast uh silicon valley yeah i mean the cats exactly. the cats that i know on the west coast who are like micro dosing psilocybin and going to burning man and then figuring out ways to like fuck over their contracted workers but anyway Exactly. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, tell, talk to us about the. So within this context, there's now a pushback that like people are aware of this, and there's like people are, you know, becoming a little more weary. They're like, okay, how much of this is manipulating people? This person or, or this journalist at the time, Vance Packard, writes a book um, entitled "The Hidden Persuaders." And this sort of reflects a lot of the feelings at the time that people are becoming more critical and then there's an industry response to the response. So if you can just take it from there. Um, So, um, so yeah, there's a lot of um, unease um, with, um, with, with, with market research. um, A lot of, I mean, the, like the sort of um, larger context is, um, you know, people are, really suspicious of consumerism and it's not taken for granted the way it is now i mean that um that there's a real feeling that um you know we're slipping into a much more a much more materialistic society um where um people's um you know people's values um are um are you know are start are going to be much more about money like there's a lot of discomfort um, with the way that capitalism is progressing, like, or the way that, you know, the way that our society is, is starting to become in this period, much more hyper capitalist. Um, and, um, and the, um, um, and consumerism, I mean, is, I mean, really just a small part of that, but, um, but it's a really visible part that people can feel because people see advertisements and people, you know, participate in capitalism every day, not just by working, but also by buying stuff. So people feel very implicated in that. Um, and, um, and the, um, and so there's a lot of unease with that. And there's, um, a lot of, um, um, there's, uh, you know, funny that you um, that you tell that story about your dad because um, this is the period in which people also start to really worry that a consumerist um, and more materialistic society is also making us more conformist. Um, you know that, um, and so so you have like. I mean, you know, movies like Rebel Without a Cause um, or, you know, or, um, you know, David, sociologist David Reisman's book, The Lonely Crowd, you know, like there's all, all these different ways um, that people are starting to um, question um, the direction of our society and like whether it's, um, it's, it's really, um, um, you know, whether, whether it's, alienating you know whether it's alienating and also like what are the values um and um so um so in this context and so uh, in addition to that um there's a real feeling that advertising is manipulative and um that mark and people are starting to um, be more aware of market research um and um and market research um, it seems um, seems sneaky to people, and it also um, um, you know it and it also the the psychoanalytic um, methods that it uses seem intrusive. You know, people feel like, well, that's just like you know they're peering into our psyches and um, figuring out how to sell us stuff, and there's just a lot of discomfort with that, and so into this. Um, steps um, uh, Vance Packard, who um, a journalist, a journalist who um, who wrote a lot of books and was very successful in um, in popularizing um, popularizing um, 
critique, critiques, social critique. I mean, and um, and so he um, he he interviews a lot of market researchers and um, and then writes this book um, presenting the pro project of market research in the most sinister way possible. Um, and um, and so and it's a bestseller. Like uh, people, I mean, I mean, because it just really taps a nerve. Like even even though like when we look back at it now, it's like. It, you know, it, it's it seems a little um, overwrought. Um, like, I mean, it's just like you know, it's and 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 the sort of um, discomfort with um, with with the sort of sexualization of advertising and imagery just like seems like I don't. It just by today's standards, it reads a little bit puritanically and um, and and sort of. Um, um, and and that's partly because it's hard to for um, us as contemporary people to um, to um, under to empathize with um, how um, jarring people um, found consumer society when they first encountered it because we're so used to it. Um, so so that's part of why Vance Packard's book reads so so weirdly now. But um but um but it it really was a it, it, yeah so it was a huge huge bestseller, huge hit. Then the advertising industry was really freaked out. Um, um you know they that 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 such a um um a, a strong critique um, had been was was so popular, getting so much attention. So a lot of um, a lot of ads start to take this on directly, um, and um, and a lot of um, and there's a lot of um, opinion pieces like op eds written by people in the advertising industry um, defending the project. And um, and they um, they respond, they they res they defend market research in a couple different ways, um, and it's really smart. I mean, but, like some of their responses to him are very smart. Um, one was um, that um, you know these critics they don't always mention Packard by name, but they always mean him. <laughs> um, these critics um, don't think that the people are smart um you know that you know in, that in fact like it's really hard to figure out what people want um and um and you know and to persuade them <laughs> to buy things and so we have to do this research because people are so intelligent um, you know right. so there's like sort of a flattery of the public um which um um which is effective because that is a somewhat legitimate critique of Packard and almost every like leftist who has criticized advertising ever since, right? It's like, yeah. oh, you think the people are stupid? Um, you know, and um and so um and and then also and specifically um on gender, um there's a there's a thread running through Packard's work where he 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 really um feels especially offended at how women and children are being manipulated and the advertisers are like, you know, they, they, they sort of, um, they play the feminist card a little right. bit, you know, it's right. free feminism. Like, no, we think like women are like really complex and like, you know, and, you know, we can't figure them out, you know, um, you know, and, yeah. you know, and so there's, so there's sort of a, um, so also, also pretty propagandistically smart um, and um and then one of their um biggest um propaganda coups which is not always um this one is bigger than just their response to packard but the response to packard certainly is one of the things that really fuels it and you alluded to this earlier is um the line that the consumer is very powerful um and that um and and that um, um that um capitalism a capitalist democracy is superior to communism because um, the consumer is so power like the consumer is um rather than being manipulated um the consumer is the boss um and all of these um 
corporations are just quaking in their boots because you, um, Mrs. Shopper, could put them out of business, you know, with a whim of your, you know, <laughs> you know, just right. by deciding you don't want to buy pancake mix anymore. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Right. And then no, and through, I, we can end with the sort of the line that this takes in the next chapter. We don't have to go into the, the story of the Edsel because that you summarize sort of what they learned from that and what they did with that, which is like, and that changes throughout the book too, which I found fascinating. Just this, like how the perception of consumers, people, well, first of all, as my friend puts it at one point we were people and then we were citizens and now we're just consumers. So it's like right. like this. Right. And then how it was viewed, um, sometimes being powerful, sometimes. Uh, this, of course, it seems to me to be also one of the main lines throughout this book. And that is that women, in many ways, I, I mean, I've, in this, God, I don't know how I was going to say it, probably sounds patriarchal and sexist. I was going to say that I actually no, felt, sure. I felt bad for women more than any other group of people throughout this book because of the way um, at times seen as like mystical and mysterious at times treated like children at times totally ignored at other times, like even the struggles. I mean, I I know further in the book, there's like even the internal struggles within the industry to then gain prominence, to have those skills. Like anyway, so throughout the book, I'm just thinking like, this is just completely fucked the, the way in which, yeah, how this plays out in gendered uh, terms. So maybe we should end today sort of talking about that. Um, in chapter four, the title of chapter four is The Consumer as a Woman. Um, and what's wild is at that time, so the GIs are coming home from the war. They're working wherever they're working. And it is actually women who are the ones who are doing most of the shopping. And this is like now like, the ad men are like realizing this. They're just like, oh yeah. yeah, like, wow. Like it's actually women who are, who like are the bosses of the house. Like they're the ones running, you know, like doing the day to day, um, buying all of our, our products and so on. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I actually don't even know what the, the way in for the question on this one is. It's like, cause it will, I know that later in the chapter, it does get into the role of female researchers. Um, yeah, how would you talk about this sort of like gendered aspect of everything that's happening? You have like women now, more and more women organizing. You have like a feminist movement knocking at the door. It's about to take off in the 1960s and 70s. Um, yeah, if you just want to leave us with that today. Um, so the, the history of the focus group absolutely is a history of women and and how how women are perceived and ultimately how they participate. Um, the... Um, the um but you um you're you're right so in the in the 50s a lot of the discussion around focus group is um is about um how do we view the um the female consumer um and um and do you do, do we see the consumer as um as, do we see her as kind of um, passive and stupid if you think women are passive and stupid or do you see um, her as um, really um, mysterious and fickle um, you know um, or you know you know on the sort of um, ex- extreme sexist and like um, shallow materialistic manipulating men so they can get stuff you know right. I mean there's a lot of different ways to view the female co- um, consumer um, and um, and and it all um, it, it and they're all reflected um, it, it, they're all very um, um, prominent in the 50s um, and um, and that and you're right part of the reason for this um, is um, that um, um, that um, women are the ones consuming, making the uh, making most of the uh, household purchases in this period, um, and um, um, you know whether or not women are working, um, they are um, 
um, they are, you know, even though we know the 50s housewife is kind of a stereotype and that many women were in fact working outside the home in this period, especially working class women, but, um, but still um, they are the ones keeping house um, um, and they're, um, and they're the ones, um, they're the ones making, uh, making purchases, um, doing the household labor for which, um, you know, many uh, of the consumer goods are supposed to help. Um, and, um, so, and, and the, the dilemma that corporate America finds itself in is, um, that in addition to being, um, corporate elites trying to speak to the masses, they also find that they are men trying to speak to women. So like the, the consumer is alienated from the corporate elites in two ways, right? right? I mean, not only is she not um, the head of a corporation or even of a creative department, um, she, um, um, but um, she's not a man, um, and so, so they're like so that they're so they're hampered in a number of ways, and so the focus groups are tremendously helpful um, in this way because. Um, because it, it helps the it helps the male elites to um, get into the nitty gritty of what is women's experience. Um, I mean, like like what is it like to try to scrub a floor? You know, what is it like to you know? Right. <laughs> what is it like right. to like um, you know um, like w- when you make cornmeal? Like, what are you looking for in the cornmeal box? You know, I mean, you know, and you know, just sort of these things that they um, don't know, you know, by virtue of not performing that kind of labor. Um, so, um, so it's really, um, um, so, so it's tremendously useful. And, um, and, and then, but then also, um, there are a lot of interesting um, moments where the male researchers um, sometimes find um, that, um, that, that, um, they sometimes find communication gaps um, between themselves um, and the women who are subjects, you know, like they, like they're, you know, they're um, like, they don't um, really um, understand like, why would you like, 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 you know, what, why, why wouldn't you put gloves on every time you wash the dishes? Don't you care about keeping your hands nice? And the women are just like, no, we just don't, we don't care. No, like, you know, like, and, right. and it would be a pain to put your gloves on every time, you know, we do so much, we're washing the dishes all day long, you know, and, and there, so there are these this really granular little like gaps in their experience. So the focus groups are helping, but they're also, um, constantly revealing that they're helping corporate America to understand the female consumer, but they're also constantly revealing um, these gaps. And I'll just end by saying what's wild about this, of course, is that their own prejudices, their own sort of short sightedness, their own reactionary sexist ideology actually undercuts the profit motive by them not yeah. taking the advice, by being like, well, We've heard from some women, but like we're actually going to go this way because maybe they don't even know what they really want. Like, or I, I don't know if that's how you put it, but that's like oh, I took away. Really? That's how I took away from like the end of the chapter. I'm like, my God, it reminds me actually of maybe this is drawing a crazy, too far fetched parallel, but it reminds me somewhat of today in the midst of the pandemic where like I, I hear these Wall Street analysts who are like, we need money like people need money so like you know give them the six hundred dollar extension like we've got friends who that just was cut off for like like but then the ideology is like well we want to be cruel and mean or whatever the fuck these snake charmers in the republican party are thinking and it's like so they are against something that actually makes sense even within the logic of capitalism be from their own biases it's anyway it was what i thought of when i'm reading that really right sometimes ideology gets um gets it gets in the way of capitalism in this case um they um that they they were i mean it's always it's 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 always a a back and forth but they um but you know um one of one of many ways that they um sort of powered through um, in the in the on on this um on this challenge was um um in this period 
um, the companies start hiring a lot more women as market researchers. And it actually becomes um, not only like a job that women have um, in advertising, um, um, with, with advertising firms, it, um, it also is um, in this period, 50s and 60s, um, where um, you start um, seeing um, more um, um, women entrepreneurs um, who, you know, market researchers who have their own small firms. And that's it, it really interesting to me because that's continued to this day. Like there still are a lot of um, women market researchers who have their own like tiny firm, like maybe they have a couple employees. Um, and, um, and, and that, um, that starts um, in the 50s. But you're right. Um, what's funny about that is that sometimes, and uh, like I have a, uh, like a story about this in the book that I think you're alluding to, um, it, you know, sometimes um, then they're not only confronted by the women consumers that they don't want to listen to, but they also are confronted by the problem of not wanting to listen to the market researcher, right. like wh whose opinions and, and interpretation of her data is constantly challenged, um, you know, and, um, and, and the sort of, um, dislike and distrust of the female consumer is often then projected um, onto the researcher. Um, so, so, so she becomes um, often kind of an embattled figure, um, even though they really need her expertise. Well, well, I appreciate your time today, Liza. Next, the second part, we'll jump into the 1970s, the entry of focus groups into politics, the story of New Coke, all kinds of things that I learned and found fascinating. So, yeah, thank you very much for your time. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Vince. Yeah, we'll talk to you soon. Okay, all that right. sounds great. Take care. Bye -bye. You've been watching Park Media. I'm your host today, Vince Emanuele, and we'll talk to you soon. Excellent. Hey, thank you for watching and listening. If you think this program is worth a pack of cigarettes or a cheeseburger, you could become a Patreon for as little as $3 a month. The link is available at our website, parkmedia.org. That's P-A-R-C media.org. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel below. Also, you could find us on Instagram at Park Media, Facebook at Politics, Art, Roots, Culture, and you could find me on Twitter at Vince Emanuele.